Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Blue Shift monthly Zoom q and It's April 2nd, 2022. We've got some exciting updates as we are fully in the home stretch of our historic equity crowdfunding campaign on WeFunder. As always, I'm joined by Blue Shift founder and CEO, Sasha Derry, and our marketing coordinator, Tom McKee, or, sorry, Todd McKee. <laughs> but most importantly, today we are joined by almost the entire team of Blue Shift engineers. And they are here to answer your questions. But uh, first, I want to hand things over to Sasha for a few opening remarks. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seth. And thank you, everybody, very much for joining in this morning. Uh, uh, morning here. Actually, now it's officially afternoon on the East Coast of the United States. Um, first of all, I wanted to, you know, last night we had a real pleasure of meeting many of our investors in person. We had a special event for folks uh, who invest at a certain level or and above. Uh, on our crowd equity funding campaign here on WeFunder. And it was just a real pleasure to interact with folks, show them around, uh, not only Stardust and the peers in the background, uh, the test site where so much work and effort's been placed, uh, the workshop where so much of the construction is done, uh, but just to chat and meet with the folks. So uh, thank you guys. For those who are even here attending this webinar, thanks for joining us again. Uh, I hope you had fun last night, and we hope to see many of you in the future if we didn't get to see you this time around. So thank you so much. Oh, and hello to Cape Town, by the way. Thank you. Nice to see the folks from Max IQ, Bjarka and Judy. Thank you all very much. Um, so it's it's been an extremely exciting uh, last couple of weeks, um, but let me start with first updates on uh, launch site. As their folks know, uh, our, our first... Um, uh, choice for a potential launch site off of off the coast of Maine is not going through uh, off the Jonesport uh, town of Jonesport. However, we are in conversations. We continue conversations with other towns off of the down east coast. But as I mentioned last time, we continue to push forward to uh, to have our very first next launch all the way to space with our uh, first version of Starless Rogue to be down uh, at one of NASA's launch sites on the East Coast here. I say one of because there's actually two in play. The uh, more to come, stay tuned on our WeFunder updates to get specifics on that. But the whole idea is, as you guys all know, is for us to uh, get to a qualified launch all the way to space with Starless Rogue that allows us to get up to $2 million in revenue for every launch there on after, because we can qualify for NASA Flight Opportunities Program and not only take Max IQ student uh, experiments up to space, but also take uh, professional researchers experiments up to space as well. So we're very excited about that. We have a lot of work to go ahead of us. And, um, but uh, uh, really the universe is our oyster. Uh, the, the other part that I wanted to point out is, um, some really exciting news is, look, we broke a million dollars in, in in our crowd equity campaign. This is amazing. And we were encroaching, uh, Todd and Seth, what, 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 how far away are we from the 34,000? 34,000. So we're just $34,000 shy of the 1.07 campaign goal. So we, we broke 1 million uh, several days ago. And I think we have a real shot. At, at reaching our, our ultimate goal of 1.07 million. Of course, if we go over, uh, there's no harm done there either. That just gives gives us more runway to go. So I, you know, again, I just want to go back to the beginning of what I was saying, which was, you know, it was really great to show folks our investors. Uh, many of you are on this call right now. Um, what your money went to? It's going to the folks. Many of the folks you see here are paying our, our salaries to do, you know, let their genius run. Uh, to design Starless Rogue and begin, build the full-size Marvel engine, but also much of it's gone into the building of the test stand, uh, uh, a lot of simulation, there's a lot of software we have to pay for, the leasing of uh, the hangar here with the users, so much uh, of, of what you guys have uh, invested in Blue Shift, you can physically see here in our people and in the test stand uh, here at, at Brunswick Landing in Brunswick, Maine. So I do hope that Eventually, all of you have an opportunity to come by and visit us here in, in Brunswick, Maine. So, Sasha, if you could just jump yeah. in real quick, let's yeah. uh, let uh, the team here kind of explain what they do and who yes, they are. Yes, exactly. So, I, yeah, I definitely yeah. want to. Uh, so, the next thing is to we want to share the big part of the show is really to share with you guys uh, what the, sort of the, gen, the genius behind our team. Uh, and what you see on here is many, most of the engineers on our team. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and name folks here. 
And what we're really hoping, and we got this actually came out of a Discord server saying, gosh, I really want to talk to some of the engineers. I want to hear from the engineers. Let's talk to them. And this is so this is your guys' opportunity to hear from them, ask them questions, and they will do their best uh, to share what they're working on, what they're doing, and answer your questions as bizarre as they might be. So please don't hold back. Um, so I'm going to start from visually what I see from left to right. Um, Luke, would you please introduce your, your title and what the things you work on here at Blue Shift? Sure. Thanks, Sasha. Um, yeah, my name's Luke. Um, uh, my title is uh, Lead Mechanical Engineer here at uh, Blue Shift. Um, went to the University of Maine. Um, my role on the team is um, I've been with Blue Shift for a um, a while now, and I've helped a lot with the modeling and strategizing for the sizing of the vehicles and the motors to sort of achieve our end goals um, and doing uh, propulsion simulations and design um, and then um, sort of all hands on deck. So definitely turning wrenches too on the day to day. Cool. Thank you, Luke. All right. And next one on my screen here is Alex. Alex, would you introduce your title and uh, what you do here and what you're working on in Blue Shift. Sure. Uh, so my name is Alex Morrow. Um, I am uh, a structural aerospace engineer here at Blue Shift. Uh, I've been with the company for about a year. Uh, I think I was able to be hired as a direct result, you know, of the, the WeFunder um, raising. So since I've been here, um, I've started uh, helping to work on, you know, sizing the sizing the flight vehicle and the structural components for the flight vehicle, um, and in the last few months, really helping out, you know, everybody, kind of all hands on deck, trying to get to that first test, um, doing a lot of the hands on work as well. So I think, you know, most of the engineers here are are technically sound and also get their hands dirty um, as well. So I've been doing a, a little bit of everything. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, the next one on my screen is David, David Hirikian, who uh, has been with us for quite a while, but I don't want to steal your stuff. Go ahead, David. Hi, uh, hi guys. I'm David. I'm uh, the CTO at Blue Shift. I've been working on the project since 2015, 2014, and uh, I've seen a lot of the changes in the evolution of the project into what it's become now, and it's it's very exciting. I get to I get to work with all the engineers and interface with the rest of the team to guide some of the strategy from like a top level on where the project said I get to get my hands dirty occasionally as well, which is good. Uh, everything from sweeping floors to, uh, to commercialization models. So happy to be here and talk to you guys. Thank you, David. All right, Gerard, you want to give your title and what you do? Yeah, I'm the lead propulsion test engineer. Uh, I graduated from the university of Maine with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I am working on fuel manufacturing and production, as well as uh, test stand design and fabrication. And uh, just like everybody else has said, we're you know small team. I also work on um, some dynamics modeling um, stuff like that. And um, you know, as our team grows, I'll focus more on data acquisition and uh, trying to get some real learnings from our tests. Thank you, Gerard. And uh, as you can tell, you know, our guys tend to be understated in all the stuff they do and their capabilities. Uh, for the most part, any of them also can pick up a, a, a welding stick and start or start putting stuff together, pick up a, a CNC machine and, and make things happen, magic happen. So uh, this very, let alone all the other things, the, the capacities and aptitudes these gentlemen have. All right, let's uh, let's let it go. Please feel free to ask these guys questions, curiosities, what you might have on on what they do day to day, how they do it, maybe how they got here from where they wherever they came, um, where they want to go, what to see things are going. Uh, feel free to nerd out. This is your opportunity. We're hoping you'll you'll uh, ask them the hard questions. Welding rod. Thank you, Trudy. <laughs> I've only had one cup of coffee. I knew it wasn't a welding stick, but it was a cup you threw. I was like, oh, that's not quite the right word. Caffeination sequence engaged. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yes. by all means, you know, in, in, enter your questions or comments into the chat, or uh, also maybe we can uh, unmute you and, and give you a chance to, to speak directly um, to the engineers and to the world. I think the first thing we could just do, so while we're waiting for some to right. come in, is, uh, you know, Gerard, or I'll just pick on Gerard this time. Uh, Gerard, what do you... Um, 
you know, what stage are you in, in looking for the engines? Like you, you, we saw, we all saw the first test with five seconds. Um, uh, just talk about where you eventually you want the engine to be. What's the the end goal with all the tests? Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the tests also. So, you know, we did a five second test. We're we're trying to strategize to get the most learning that we can out of as, as few tests as possible. Um, obviously, because every time we run tests, we're using materials. Um, so we're, you know, we did a five second test. We're going to move on to some ignition tests to really crack down on our ignition sequence. Um, then we're going to move on to longer duration tests and uh, playing around with different variables. Eventually we'll be stepping up, you know, five seconds to 10 seconds, 20 seconds, really start to, uh, stress the system, uh, thermally. And, um, the end goal is to really characterize uh, our, you know, the many different variables that come with uh, a hybrid engine. Hybrids are super unique with the solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer. And the way it's, the way you use it is very important. Um, so the, the end goal is to get to a point where, you know, very end goal is we're testing our complete flight system from the, the actual oxidizer tank that we're going to be using on the vehicle and the actual combustion chamber, the actual nozzle. Um, and yeah, and to do that, it's, it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, we're hopefully going to do, you know, a test a week, if not, if not quicker than that. Um, and every time we test, get new learnings, make some tweaks, do it again. Um, yeah. And really try to really try to find a solution uh, for uh, our first flight. And I was telling a, a lot of our, uh, our guests yesterday, you know, this, what you see in the tests and what they saw in the workshop, you see this big behemoth of uh, a combustion chamber. Um, you know, maybe not what you think of when you think of uh, rocket science and uh, precision, but this, the whole name of the game for us right now is, a nice, durable, uh, useful test stand and uh, test hardware that can get us there through these, you know, multiple 20 plus tests. Um, um, and it doesn't look like the flight vehicle, what the flight vehicle would be, but everything about the kind of like the shape and the general size uh, of the components, where the components are going to be located, um, you know, the how we decide to make uh, the, the shape of the nozzle is very important, obviously. Um, that's what we're testing so that when we do move to flight hardware testing, we're gonna be, we're already gonna know uh, what to expect. That's great, um, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Todd, can we roll the clip yeah. of that test real quick? Um, actually, I don't have it queued up and ready, oh. so sorry about okay. that. <laughs> I got you. Give me a second. Um, so one, one, of the, come in. one of the other questions, yeah, is just was coming in. Maybe I'll throw this one to Luke. Is um, did, did you talk about the, the results of the one test that we all saw? Uh, were you happy with the results? Um, yes, in, in short, yes. Um, it was our very first um, test of, a, of our 24 inch hybrid motor. Um, previous tests had been with six inches, uh, a six inch diameter motor. And um, with all rocket engines and hybrids in particular, um, scaling, scaling something up can be unpredictable. Um, and hybrids are known for instability at the larger sizes, um, especially. So um, while we felt like we had a fair amount of experience from our previous motors, um, you still don't know exactly what to expect with the larger scale. Um, and uh, the fact that it was a stable, um, clean burn um, without any um, particularly hard starts or, or instabilities was a huge success um, and gives us confidence moving forward with future tests. Um, we were able to uh, light it successfully. Um, we had a couple scrubs um, leading up to the test, but if uh, this is our very first burn of this motor, that's um, doing pretty well. So we got good ignition. Um, we're going to move forward with tightening up the timing on that. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, the burn was stable. That's a huge point. Um, 
And our data acquisition was a little limited on that first test. That's something that um, we're ramping up. Um, but the data that we got uh, suggested that our performance um, was uh, quite good and on par with what we were getting with our six inch motor, which is really encouraging considering it was our first test. Um, our automated systems on the test stand worked well. Um, and that was a big part of it is just making sure that um, making sure that the systems on the test stand are all operational. We were able to uh, rehearse our safety, uh, our safety routines, um, our emergency procedures in case uh, something does go wrong, make sure that all made sense. Um, you know, tests, data acquisition and remote control, we are controlling that test from uh, over a mile away. Um, so there's some logistics involved with that. Um, so yeah, we were happy with it. Um, lots of lots of work to do, lots of tests to run still, as Gerard is talking about. Um, and we've got lots of variables that we want to test um, to see what their effect is like on this larger motor. Um, so lots to do, but it was a really great start. Great. Um, so there, there is also some questions in here that are very uh, specific in the Zoom. Um, and uh, if you want to just send an email, if you have a lot of specific questions about details of sizes of payloads and exact measurements and stuff, uh, feel free to email out uh, to BlueShift and it's a little easier to, uh, to answer things that way. So um, we're not ignoring your questions. There's just a lot of details in there. So um, send those to us and uh, we'll see if we can help you out. Uh, so David, uh, real quick, quick, quick question. It sounds like a simple question, but it's probably very complicated. How hard is it to manufacture an engine? I guess it depends on what you want the engine to do. So to put together the static test motor, uh, the team did a lot of work on making sure that it was really robust. And that actually helps manufacturability quite a bit. Um, cutting uh, 2D cuts in, in plate steel, big, thick, beefy parts that can withstand the loads that, that um, they're going to be exposed to with a high, high factor of safety. It's pretty easy. Um, making a flight-capable motor becomes a different battle because then you need all the same capabilities. You need to be able to contain the pressures and temperatures that it's going to be exposed to without popping, which is something that uh, without popping and being lightweight while it's doing that. Right. So it needs to be able to fly and it needs to be able to, uh, it needs to be able to fly, withstand pressures, withstand temperatures, uh, environmental factors on the ground at the test stand. We're using steel that you can see it's sitting in the rain, uh, we throw a tarp over it. We we have to do some level of uh, environmental control on it, but it's a different animal compared to the flight motor. So right now things have been, I'd say even our like the most complicated system that we have is our injection mechanism, uh, the most complicated mechanical system that's part of the motor, um, the injection mechanism and all the plumbing associated with it. And that was challenging. That took a lot of work, but it, it was work that uh, there was no space constraints. It didn't have to fit into a launch vehicle. Um, we got to use an entire, you know, 100 by 100 square foot pad of concrete to lay everything out the way we needed. When we try to fit all this into a two foot diameter motor on a, on a 50 foot long vehicle, things will get things will get more interesting and it will become more challenging. That's the short answer. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. So, Sasha, you want to and Seth, you guys want to uh, go on to the next uh, subject? Actually, there's some, there are some questions that we're getting directly. I'd, I'd love to, I'll go oh, ahead and just pose them. You're free. I try um, to catch them all, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and let's see. Uh, I'm going to bring this one back to Luke. Um, uh, it, so for the flight, the very first flight, um, we have a, a gentleman asking, uh, Bjork is asking, what is our expected altitude ex um, and expected flight time? Sure. Um, well, it, that there's lots of ways to answer that question, I guess, it, and it really depends maybe on <clears throat> what our um, what our ultimate launch location is. Um, there could be reasons to keep our altitudes low on the initial tests to to um, cater to a specific launch site um, and for testing purposes. But um, the first iteration of Starless Rogue is. Um, likely to go to space, but um, not a whole lot more. So um, in the 100 to 150 kilometer range. And then um, after that, uh, with a, a little bit more propellant and um, the next iteration of hardware that will be um, a bit lighter, 
um, we'll be pushing all the way up to um, the 350 to 400 kilometer range. Um, and in terms of flight time, that's a number that I don't actually have the top, have off the top of my head, which sounds ridiculous, but I have so many, so many numbers running through my head all the time. I just write them all down and I, I don't have that in front of me, but we we're hoping to have, uh, well, we are designing for um, between um, six and eight minutes, sort of zero G time. So that's a number for time duration um, to keep in mind for the, for the higher altitudes. Now, I'll, uh, I'll answer, thank you, Luke, and I'll answer some questions here too that, that I see that Bjorka put in there. Won't be able to get all to them. Uh, these are all ones that we definitely should uh, bang out. But um, the expected launch site, of course, we're trying to figure that out. We know it's going to be off the coast of something and somewhere um, off the eastern seaboard. Um, whether that will have more or less lobsters, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, so certainly sea base idle time. What was our expected idle time before flight? Um, I think it's um, I think it's quite probable that at least an hour to three hours be, uh, would be the absolute bare minimum um, between when the rocket's being taken from uh, where integration is occurring and being excuse me to when staff is moving away from the rocket and to when it's launching. Uh, my expectation would be many many hours before that uh, when the payload has been integrated into the rocket. Um, and launch, kind of similar to what I would expect what we saw in Stardust where really integration, uh, much of the integration happened, what, uh, Luke, the, the night before um, is when we did the integration and the payloads were sitting there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, we've, we've thrown around lots of ideas for the, the um, most efficient way to integrate payloads in terms of keeping that time low. Um, yeah. So it's hard to give a precise number, but that is a factor we're all aware of is, um, you know, we know people want to have access to their payload until the last possible second. So, yeah. And, you know, one of the differences with this, uh, with this next round is we will, I know Bjarke, you'd ask this question, we will be providing power to our payloads, or at least to most of them. Um, so uh, we will likely have a, a 24 to 28.8 volt option and probably actually a five volt uh, based option as well. Um, so uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, I just want to see if there's Sasha, any other... Um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to just circle back real quick because yep. you mentioned the the launch site we're launching off the coast of somewhere. So the long arc of this is where we, we will be launching from May, right? We're, we're coming home, but Absolutely. this next launch, at least we, we, we're probably going to have to go somewhere else just in terms of meeting a very important deadline. Uh, can you just walk us through that real quick? Yeah, I, th I think I, I think I purchased in the beginning, but yeah, we're, the important thing here is uh, we want to qualify for the NASA Flight Opportunities Program as a, well, as a flight provider. Um, and that's where uh, the researchers can get funds somewhere between three hundred fifty and five hundred fifty thousand dollars to pay us that amount to launch their payloads up to space and bring it back down again. And so, um, for us, it is a really um, uh, aggressive target to get to that first launch above one hundred kilometers that Luke was mentioning. Uh, so, for that reason. Uh, we are disassociating where the launch site will be ultimately in Maine and like, well, let's just go find a launch site and get that done, take care of that qualifying launch and in parallel work the effort of, of working with the FAA and developing a qualified launch site uh, along with our qualified launch vehicle um, and not allow there to be that dependency. So the important thing here is to get to market, generate revenue as soon as, quick, as, soon as possible, qualify for that program and in parallel work, work the launch site in Maine. So Sasha, there's one question from Jen that is uh, a U of Maine grad that is um, wanting to know where someone would go if they're looking for an internship at the company. Yeah, uh, we've gotten, um, well, you know what? I am going to pass that off to David, but so much, uh, if it's from an technical uh, standpoint, engineering standpoint, we've had a lot of applicants, in fact, a lot of applicants, much, much more than we've ever seen in the past for internships. And I know that uh, David's been working on that. Uh, David, do you want to speak to that a bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think at this point, we're basically topped off with uh, who we need for summer interns in this upcoming summer, or at least very close to it. I am not discouraging you from applying, though. I think that everyone who wants to uh, to get in touch with us, I'd say, first of all, go on the website and submit uh, submit an application via the web form there and do it more than once. We get so many applicants that uh, persistence actually ends up standing out. If I see someone's name in there more than once, I realize that people actually uh, 
they, they're paying attention to what we're doing. And when they see us, they, they want to reach out and they want to be part of the team and that helps. Um, but yeah, please do apply. Please do let us know about your interest and, and your expertise. And, uh, and typically what I'll do is I'll reach back out or someone on the team will reach back out and ask for a resume or, or we'll schedule some interviews. And even though I think we're close to topped out for the summer, um, there may be opportunities throughout the year or uh, if we can start to develop a relationship with some of the people in the, in the main aerospace ecosystem or academic ecosystem for that when you're outside of that ecosystem and ready to go into the professional world, uh, we're, we're happy to take you in as we grow. We're going to need a team of, uh, for, for Stardust, approaching 20, uh, for, sorry, for Stardust Rogue, approaching 20, and for uh, Red Dwarf, we'll be in the hundreds. So we're going to be a growing main company that's looking for people like you. So yeah, reach out now and reach out again. And hopefully we can start the conversation like that. And I also want to mention um, that uh, the main uh, for folks, uh, the, for students that are at, at University of Maine or other Maine colleges and universities, there's actually um, you, uh, the state grant consortium, the state, excuse me, the Maine Space Grant Consortium. Um, and actually each state has this. It's, it's actually funded by NASA. Um, but in, in our state, um, there are funds allocated for um for folks to intern uh, with aerospace related companies such as Blue Shift. Um, but I also wanna encourage that, uh, I know that many other space grant consortiums in other states provide those internships, uh, funding for those internships. And if you're even if you go to a you know, school outside of, well outside of the state of Maine, um, as we've, we're already having interns do, um, you can get funding from these other space grant consortiums often. So something to look into. <clears throat> You know, there's one other little tidbit of news that I shared with folks, um, darn, I don't have in front of me, um, but there's, um, we just got a letter from uh, one of our state senators, uh, Senator Collins, Susan Collins, informing us that a bill uh, had passed um, that allocates uh, uh, $400,000 of federal monies to, in this case, uh, the state of Maine to fund, um, uh, fund, student space science modules. These are like the max IQ modules. These are folks that uh, roll around this call, but also uh, have signed their first launch contract with, with, uh, with our company. Uh, but we're really excited about this particular program uh, on a state level because this is putting uh, monies into uh, schools all over the state, no matter how rural or urban they are here in the state, allows kids uh, to really uh, blossom and really allow their curiosity to lead them forward and explore literally space. And if all goes well, um, launch with their, a main company, uh, Blue Shift Aerospace. So I realize that's a very much a, a main based question. We have people all over the world uh, on this call, um, but we're really excited about that and, and the support by, uh, by, by our senators and of course the Biden administration to um, support it, uh, space education, aerospace education here in the state of Maine. I did wanna share that. It's also actually a really good uh, possible revenue source for us in the short term. Other questions? Yeah, well, uh, speak, speaking of the short term, I don't know if this is a, a better question for, for Sasha or David, but uh, Donald Higgins asked, when's the next flight test? So what, what's, our, what's our general outlook there? I'm gonna pass that hot potato to David. So when's the next flight, yeah? Um, I think it means engine uh, test, right? Engine test, I think we're looking for. Engine test. Uh, the next engine test, uh, somewhere in the realm of two to four weeks, um, depending on how quickly we can get our, uh, we're, we're doing some upgrades to the safety system before we start running the test at full power. Um, so the last test we ran uh, with partial uh, partial uh, oxidizer flow, I think we got up to 70% ballpark uh, and, uh, and under pressure. So as we bump, as we amp things up, we want to make sure that we're, we're mitigating all the potential risks that are associated with that. And we hope that in the next few tests, we'll be doing uh, that full flow. Uh, prior to that, we'll be doing some basically ignition tests where we open, we're going to, we're going to start our igniter, which is a glorified flamethrower. Um, and then we're going to run a single injector. And that's just going to be, if you watch the engine test video from before, there's like a lazy flame that comes out before where the whole motor just looks like a giant flamethrower for a moment before you get that. Uh, it's choked flow where you get the full rocket, uh, a strong vector to the exhaust. So we'll be doing that single injector flow test prior to the, the full flow test. So depending on which one you're asking, I think we're probably two weeks away 
two weeks ish away from the uh, single injector test, which will be a lazy flamethrower. And then four weeks from giant, loud, beautiful, glorious hybrid burning into the main sky now, or on the main. Ground. Now this is kind of splitting hairs, but that is, that is uh, we wouldn't call, we would call that a, a, a static fire test, right? I, I like to tell people we're not launching anything on purpose. Um, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Thanks. And so then the next test flight would be that Starless Rogue beta flight. Um, and the outlook for that is still end of this year. Outlook for that is within 12 months. Okay. Best goal is by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Engineering, you know, CEO dude. <laughs> <laughs> you got your rhinoceros horn on right now. I'm ready. <laughs> the ultimate showdown. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I feel bad, Alex. We've got to give Alex a question. The poor guy has a chance. To I have one. I have one. Excellent. Yeah, let's give him um, one. <laughs> Alex, I, I noticed this this uh, a series of photographs behind you of a, what appears to be a rocket launch. Is that is that of personal <laughs> significance to you? Um, yeah, it is. I guess. Um, so that is that was the last uh, last flight of the space shuttle. Um, and myself and Gerard, when we were in college, actually went to go view it. Um, went to go view it in person because we were saying, you know, hey, this is something we really need to do uh, before they stop before they stopped this program. So it was in our senior year in college and um, Gerard and Luke and I actually went to school together and you know, our senior capstone in college was a, a two-stage sounding rocket. So we were already in the rocketry realm, um, you know, knowing that our heart was in aerospace and uh, Gerard and I uh, flew down there to go watch the last, the last flight of the space shuttle. Um, and it was, it was something else. Definitely. I was, I would say ignited a passion, but the passion was already there. It just kind of, um, it, uh, it, it, pumped it, 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 it pumped oxidizer over the flames. Let's say it really, it really got it going. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it meant a lot to me and, and just for my love of, of, um, aerospace. Yeah. That was a fun, that was a fun summer. I got, I was actually was lucky enough and, uh, had the amazing opportunity to intern down at uh, Marshall space flight center that summer. So I got to, um, say hi to, uh, Alex and Gerard after the uh, launch. I think that was Atlantis, right? Um, and yep. uh, at Marshall, I actually got to meet um, a couple of mentors um, who have been uh, invaluable to our development. Um, uh, one of which is I noticed in uh, the um, attendance. And um, so, yeah, that was a great summer, 2011. Shout out to George Story. <laughs> I know Luke was being bashful. Um, okay, uh, Sasha, there's one question from Barrett in there if we want to just ask that to the team real quick. It's uh, so regarding flight tests, what type of control do you plan to use in regards of aerodynamics and maintaining stability? One of the engineers would like to take that one. I can take that one if no one else wants to speak to it. Um, so I, I think our philosophy is always minimum viable product to deliver what we want. Um, and as we need more um, flight control, we'll add it. And um, initially it will probably be um, roll control to give our customers a nice um, um, stable ride in terms of not um, rotating too quickly. Um, and uh, it will probably be using some sort of reaction control system um, uh, probably cold gas, um, something, you know, basic and simple. And then uh, uh, it is remains to be determined how much more than that we need for our suborbital flights. Um, and then of course we'll have to do um, full on control for, for the orbital vehicles. Yeah. And just to add to that, uh, I think, I think you basically covered it, but um it's likely that we'll be developing the attitude control system with each flight uh, in the sense that we may be flying um, some of the hardware without actually flying the, without actually actuating it. So um, we've, we've procured some, some NASA software and hardware that's related to attitude control. And um, it, it is, it is, 
probable that in the alpha and beta flights, we'll be flying something similar or approaching what uh, pieces of the hardware that are going to be going into 1.0, into that first high altitude suborbital flight. Uh, but, but we won't be using it um, until, until we need to, minimum viable product, like Luke said, basically researching our own hardware. All right, Sasha and Seth, you want to, uh, are we ready to talk about the uh, WeFunder campaign that we're wrapping up? Yeah, good. Oh, there, uh, there's one question here from, uh, okay. from Curtis Thompson. Oh, I don't want to take away people's questions. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was from uh, from YouTube. Uh, who's, who's your first customer and how did it feel to, to make it there? And uh, we, <laughs> we could we could actually uh, bring them on to talk about what it feels like to be our first customer. Uh, but uh, Sasha, would you, would you kind of uh, tell us that, that story again real quick? Yeah, uh, our first customer is uh, Max IQ, um, and uh, yeah, the uh, folks Judy and Bjarka are actually on the line here. Um, if you guys can, I don't know if, if they, you want to message them, see if they're willing to talk. I know it's very impromptu, and we're, we're asking a lot to suddenly ask people to be on the spot. They don't have to be on the spot, but I'll I'll chew up the time if they would like to be. Well, they just got added on there if they'd like. I to did, okay, you guys are there. You can feel free to talk if you don't want to talk. You're not ready. We put you on the spot. Um, some people might still. I'm be here. Kind of, Oh, there we go. Bianca. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm here as well. I'm so okay. pleased. Um, I'm so pleased that my camera's not on because then you would be seeing <laughs> us in our gardening clothes. Uh, it's <laughs> now um, it's now uh, just past six thirty in the evening in Cape Town. Yeah, so you've had the full Saturday. <laughs> Yes, Judy. Do you want to just explain what we are doing? Um, they want to know a little bit about uh, why we are the first client and what we do. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, Sasha, thank you for building the most marvelous company. Uh, we were very, very, very pleased when we when we found you. Uh, we were actually introduced by the main space grant consortium to you. Um, and I, I'm not sure if everybody saw, but earlier in the chat, I actually posted the link to all the Space Ground Consortia so that you can actually go and look. Whichever state you're in, uh, you can then uh, have the contact details for your Space Ground Consortium. And, um, yeah, we've been looking for uh, a launch partner for our education payloads. Um, what we really, really need is we need... Um, very um, short missions, uh, so that we can, so that we can deliver our space STEM program within an academic year. And um, we really liked um, the, the altitude. Uh, getting into space, it doesn't have to be all that much further. Um, you know, uh, one millimeter over the common line is uh, fantastic. That checks the box for us. Um, and uh, what's really great about the suborbital missions is that uh, the students are going to get their payloads back so they can collect data on an SD card, they can test their hardware, they can test their code, they can test everything um, before they actually put it into a full-blown satellite into orbit. Um, currently, we have this massive challenge globally, and that is that 50% of student satellites that are ever launched never actually send any messages, any data. But nobody knows, is it because they don't turn on? Maybe they didn't survive the launch, the vibrations of the launch. Uh, maybe they weren't charged up, uh, whatever it may be. There's a multitude of challenges. Whereas on a suborbital launch, we can test all of that. So the students have got a much greater likelihood of success when they do go to orbit. Um, my, my late father always used to say that nobody learns to win by losing. And it's the same thing. We don't learn to succeed by failing. So what we're building is we're building a program where the students can succeed at every step, improve so that when they actually do go to orbit, they have got a very high likelihood of succeeding. So, yeah, so that's why we were very, very quick to book um, payload space. And uh, that is why we were very, very quick to um, secure that for, for our student groups uh, so that we didn't find that we uh, really, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say missed the boats, but missed the spaceship. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, Bjarke, I'm not sure if maybe you want to talk a little bit more about perhaps what it is that the students are going to be flying um, and the advantage that, advantages that we have with that. So, so Judy, before I do that, uh, what is that we, we have acquired four times 3U and how much of that have we, how many institutions have we signed up with that? Uh, yes, we have we have secured a minimum of four times three U uh, payloads, so that's a total of twelve CubeSat U's um, for from Blue Shift Aer Aerospace with each of their suborbital launches, and also um, when it gets to uh, orbital launch, um, certainly we are looking at the, at similar volumes um, that we will be able to we'll be able to fill. So for our first for our first uh, manifest, what we have done is we have signed up 45 institutions and that is easily going to fill three of those three U's. Um, and uh, having the fourth three U, oh, I must be careful about my numbers here. Having the fourth three U still available for us means that we can actually sign up more uh, more research institutions who want to test their test their equipment. Uh, we having a, a we are uh, doing a, a lot at this year's CubeSat Developers Workshop in California, um, uh, end of this month, end of April, um, and so we expect to easily fill that that remaining um, volume. And we've actually already opened our next manifest on our second suborbital launch. Um, with Blue Shift Aerospace, because uh, uh, we actually, we, we have a number of educational institutions, school groups who are saying, wow, um, we, we, we're running out of time to be ready for your first launch. So can we rather maybe book on the second launch? Um, but Bjarke, yes, uh, that is what we have. Um, uh, I'm sure that if we find that we are, we need more volume, um, uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, I can go begging, but you know the thing is with a very frequent, uh, uh, with a great cadence and frequency of of suborbital launches, um, I don't think that's going to be a challenge. Thank, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Bjarke. Actually, Bjarke, if you just uh, just take a minute or two just to talk about the many different type of experiments, well, I think it'd be really cool to understand um, for folks that are on on a view this video to understand all the different things these students are capable of doing. Of course, this is just a, probably the droplet of what they it's what their curiosity can allow them to do. And then we actually have to do a, a, a drawing for a, uh, the move the Blue Shift movie poster. Yeah, thank you. Um, so very short. Uh, so uh, we are doing a, a, this very modular um, setup where um, a, a class can actually click together. Um, Maybe a little rich to call it a satellite now, but at least a circuit, and and that's um, have the same size as a as as a, a slice of a cube set, so ten by ten centimeter, almost four by four inches. So so that that gets clicked together. Uh, we have in the long run allocated a centimeter of a slice, uh, so that means that we can have thirty um, thirty payloads in a three U satellite. In the first one here, we kind of like are starting with 15. So we're only slotting in every second uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, we don't have a problem with, with uh, space and, and heat and uh, power and all those kind of things. Um, so, so yeah, uh, so what SAS is holding up is, is uh, some yeah, of these. Right here. Uh, yeah, these are, this is yeah, what it looks like. These are little. And you just click it together like, uh, like SAS is doing there. Um, the, the, this is uh, like the starter kit he holds in the hand. So this is what the what, what the institution many times get in initially to uh, uh, to build a, a kit and, 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 and play around with it in a, in a classroom. The, the one that's going to fly, um, we finished with the um, with the development of the boards. So, so they are actually being shipped as we speak. So they um, that's a slightly bigger board um, that have. Uh, um, a slightly bigger processor than the one you have there on your, in your hand. It have uh, extra memory. It have a camera on board or, or room for a camera on board. It have a slot for an SD card because we hope that uh, we recover the, 
the payload so the data can be stored locally as well as uh, uh, some of the payload can be downloaded. And then there's a number of different sensors you can choose between that you then can uh, put in your kit. Some of them you can uh, click together. Some of the bigger institutions uh, that we have on board, so like Princeton, um, um, Taylor University who was behind the Syntad program, is also on this program here. Um, I think also um, um, Stanford uh, is uh, on this thing here. I can't actually remember. Um, but they are prototyping their own the, uh, development. So we have a number of prototype boards that allow you to, to, um, to, um, to put your payload on without that you have to consider a power and radio transmission and all the other slightly more difficult. But if you just want to do a payload, say you want to do an immune detector or something like that, you can put that on our um, on our on a prototype board and click it into our main board, and then you can then fit that in. So yeah, the reason why uh, you saw all these different questions is because uh, we're very interested in uh, in making sure that we have enough power and there's a window so we can see out of the camera and all these different things. But um, I'm sure we're getting around to that uh, eventually. And then, as I said, by the way, I think in uh, less than a month we're coming and visiting you. So uh, awesome. uh, guys, if you're around, wonderful. Then we're gonna see you. We are uh, before we go to. Uh, California for Cal Poly, we are taking a trip around Maine. I think Judy have lined up a lot of- coming just at the right time. Spring is here and flowers will be popping out of the ground. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully the ice is less. Yeah. (laughs) And the lobster is rich. No, we'll be definitely gone. So so, so we will be there. Um, uh, Judy have the exact date, but we will be there. And then uh, we're going off to uh, Cal Poly where we are uh, actually doing workshops in building uh, these satellites here um, at, at Cal Poly for, for, I think there's 500 participants at the CubeSat conference there. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you very much, Bjarka and Judy. Uh, I really, I'm excited to have you guys here, see you guys in 3D. Um, and uh, their company, Max IQ, has been really important to, uh, uh, we think, sparking uh, curiosity in space and space sciences, uh, of course, not only uh, in Maine, but across the world. And we're looking forward to, to having all four of those three U payload bays on board our uh, maiden voyage of Starless Rogue. So thank you guys very much. Very cool. All right. Um, and by the way, I think somebody asked the question, what do we feel about? We were ecstatic um, about getting the, the, launch, uh, the launch contract Max IQ. Very exciting. Uh, and, um, you know, we've already been delivering these, uh, these particular modules to, uh, to high school students uh, here in Maine ourselves for that uh, maiden voyage. But uh, I think we are now to go on to what, Seth and Todd, what's the next step? All right, so it is time to, uh, to raffle off some, some movie posters. However, we, we wanna show the trailer that the poster is for. So, oh, yep, here we go. When I look up at the sky, I see so much potential. Tell me, when you saw Stardust launch, what did you see? Did you see all that possibility? Because I did. We must now begin to reach higher. Our last crowd equity funding campaign raised over three quarters of a million dollars it confirmed we have the right team, the right methodology, and the right location to achieve our goals. And with every success comes more opportunity, more potential. Our next rocket, Starless Rogue, will reach space. We have the engine, we have the design. For this next stage, we will need to raise more. Now we have to finish the rocket and build the launch site. We will have the very first polar orbit launch site on the east coast of the United States. The success we've already had, it's just the beginning. What we work on today will improve the world of tomorrow. The possibilities are endless. Let's reach for the stars.
Big thanks to uh, the Knack Factory for <laughs> making such a fun video. <laughs> it seems so cinematic. Um, and I've got to say, just from watching that, uh, it's cool to see how much the test stand, how much the team is, that test stand, it was almost bare naked compared to what uh, these guys have done today and how much work is on there. And of course, uh, um, you know, these engine tests that we had the indent of one engine test when that video was recorded and having that one behind us, um, man, it's, uh, the, the the real the real movie is uh, yet ahead of us it's really exciting um so stay tuned so all right so what is it uh, we we have committed that if we reached a million dollars in our crowd equity funding campaign uh we would raffle off uh the the fun movie posters from blue shift uh five they're five in existence this isn't an ntf although it probably should be uh <laughs> we could probably sell these for a few million each uh, but they will be highly unique uh, and only a few in the world. So five of these will be given out to uh, any folks who invested in us. Um, what was it, guys? Since uh, what was the time frame? Yeah, so it was between uh, January 31st, the one-year anniversary of Stardust, and then the, the date that we hit $1 million, uh, which I don't, I don't have that right. exact date on me right now, but it was recent. Cool. Uh, and thanks to, uh, to, to Jen, who uh, actually printed out all the names, cut them all out. Um, Behind me is uh, in in the nose cone that's been reversed upside down. We have go Todd. We have um, we have placed all the names, and so we are drawing how many five? Yep, five. Okay. All right, go ahead, Todd. Give it a good shake. Really randomize the names there. Yeah. All right. Go. All right. All right. I'm not looking here. Let's see. First name is uh, uh, Edward. A. Severding. I'm probably screwing up his name, but uh, first name. So congratulations to Edward. All right, that's number one. He gets one poster. All right. The second poster. Things you don't normally use a nose cone for. Um, okay. Uh, the next one is Eric Martin. Uh, congratulations to you, Eric Martin. Fantastic. Okay. All righty. Uh, okay, I knew it was gonna be a challenging. Okay, <laughs> we have Kutimani Tamilamani. I will put the name up because I apparently, I probably am really murdering this name. I apologize, my apologies, but congratulations. All right, let's do this one, let's see here. Whoops, I got, I got too many in that one. Okay, one, all right. This is number four. Um, this is uh, Toshauna Horton, all right. Congratulations, congratulations to you, uh, Tashona. Cool. And the last one, let's find out here. Number five for these very unique posters, which uh, only a couple handful have been made in the world and will ever be made, um, are going to you. Uh, the next one is to Nolan Tangwe. Thank you, Nolan. Congratulations. All right. Never done that before. There's a unique raffle. So congratulations to all the folks. And actually, a big thank you to all the folks um who have, have invested in us uh this has been an incredibly exciting year uh we have truly democratized access to space thanks to you our our, our investors and uh we consider you you know many of your family friends neighbors friends and family and uh and new new family members to welcome you know new blue shift family members and thanks to you guys you know, investing anywhere from $100 to tens of thousands of dollars in Blue Shift, we're able to do what we're doing today. And that is uh, democratizing la the launching of sustainable aerospace. So thank you all so very much. Let's get over the hump. Let's get over, let's get right up to the 1.07 million. The goal is just $34,000, $35,000 left. Uh, we can do it. Pass the word on to your your friends and families and member, uh, family members who think they want to see a more... Uh, sustainable option for for accessing space uh, so thank you all very much congratulations to the posters wing uh, for the poster winners the uh, blue shift movie poster winners and a really big thank you to our engineers for joining today uh thank you guys you're constantly understated folks on the outside constantly see my face and they should be seeing your faces more often but it's really the genius is really uh thanks to these many of these folks you see here on, on the call today uh, thank you guys very much for joining and keep supporting the Blue Shift. Get the word out uh, upward and onward. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.